And I am thrilled that today's Alum Fellows Reading Series features Rumbi Katesda and her work. A former festival director of the Zimbabwe International Film Festival, she was the JMD Manyeka Fellow with us at the Du Bois Institute at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, as well as an honorary fellow at the Film Study Center here at Harvard. She is a filmmaker and writer who produces independent fiction and documentary content through her company, My Jai Films. Her award-winning films have been screened across Africa and at film festivals and conferences globally. Most recently, Rumbi Katesta has directed segments for the BBC, Al Jazeera, and Apple TV. A two-time Zimbabwe National Arts Merit Award winner, she released her first feature documentary, Transactions, in 2022. It has won awards at the Encounters South African International Documentary Film Festival and at the Zimbabwe International Film Festival and was nominated for Best Documentary at the Africa Movie Academy Awards. Our discussion today is Chipo Dendere, and we are honored that she is joining us. She's Assistant Professor of Political Science in the Africana Studies Department at Wellesley College. And originally from Zimbabwe, Dr. Dendere studies democratization, elections, and voting behavior in Africa as well as the impact of social media on politics. She regularly provides commentary on African politics for CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, and also writes for the public audience and various platforms. Thank you both for participating today. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. Hi, thank you for being here. Chippo, if you don't mind, I'll get started on the segments. Um, my film, Transactions, it's a story about one Zimbabwean family's experience of migration and remittances. And it's part of a, a series of films by um, 16 African filmmakers and uh, 25 African filmmakers from 16 African countries. And mine was the contribution from Zimbabwe. So what I'd like to do before we start the discussion is to show you some excerpts from the film. Um, it'll be about 12 minutes. In the first excerpt, you'll learn about the family members who I followed for um, in the space of a year during COVID. So you'll learn about the family members in the UK, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. In the second excerpt, you'll get a sense of the eldest son's frustration um, as he's constantly being contacted to send money home and he has a conversation with a friend about that and in the third and final excerpt you'll find um it will be a uh, it'll be a family conversation because a lot of the things that they do are conversations on whatsapp um that's how they keep in touch so it'll be a, you'll you'll experience their conversation what exactly they're doing to try and meet each other after a 10-year absence and the frustrations they face in not being able to do that so, Tom, if you don't mind, please go ahead and play the clip. Nina, 
Minang Sakini Le Manching, Sas Seven Zel. Anga Funuba Soup. Nabu Witting in a problem, Guti in a car. Guess in his intang is Funai. Yakuanus with twenty Frank, a crossalam seeing Luchan. Uzen Zel, Unga Mede Wenzel or Abantuana. Unga Mede Wenzel, now moon to whom Faz was a lavantuan. My siblings are Nkaya, Bapandle, out of Zimbabwe, and I'm the only one left here. So if all goes well, my mama wati lung sisi passport ya, then ya kwa nisubuti nye e Poland. Though untanned uba i foreigner, but in a situation as a Zimbabwe, I think uhamba out of the country, and going somewhere because I change in Piloyami in a way. The income that I'm getting, I feel it's it's not that enough. It can cover, but it's not the amount that I can say whenever, even if I want to save for something, I can't, I can't save. So I'm thinking if I just try to venture into a different country altogether and see if it works. I'm just trying. It's a, it's a trial. I'm just going to try something and see if it works. I came in the UK at 2015. I'm a domiciliary carer. I help the elderly live their lives as normal as possible. And I go to uni as well. I haven't been to Zimbabwe since I came here. I am missing my family quite a lot. In Zimbabwe, I support about four people. My mom, my two cousins, and occasionally my sister Kiki. The most that I've ever sent my mom was 200 pounds. Most of the times so I would like send her like about 100 pounds every month because I'm still a student. So I don't really get much. I came to the UK in September 2015. That's the same year my sister Portia came to the UK as well. For my job, I work as an IT consultant and engineer in schools. I do dance, Southern African contemporary and traditional dance forms. It's my side self-employed business. When I first moved, I had to think about finding myself again in this new continent. In average, I send home about 150 to 200 pounds a month, depending on who needs that money and why, because I don't earn very much myself here in this country as an immigrant. I left Zimbabwe in 2008 because my life was threatened. I was threatened because of my sexual orientation. I worked three jobs as an actor, a hotel manager, and a freelance translator. I send money to Zim when I can. A little bit. I'm trying. Do you know I'm 15 years older than you? One, two, three, eight, nine, ten, nineteen. Good one, chef. <sighs> You're just trying to kill me, that's what. Don't forget. 
Nice. I'm ready can we go home. What do you think is your future? Do you see yourself going back to Congo? I would, trust me. See, for me, it's different. I don't see myself. I love my country. I love being in touch with family that are there. Like there isn't an opportunity to kick starting a new career as somebody that left and went so far ahead in my career to go back and be a setback. What about your mom? She's got a lot of stake there at the moment. Stuff that she's building and she's looking after yeah. the, you know, my little cousins there. She's got a whole thing running and you know, we help support where we can mm -hmm. if there's anything needed. I can be more useful to Zim and to, to, to Bulawayo from mm -hmm. this side mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. being actually there myself. I mean, that's a situation in most Congolese life as well. Like, yeah. You need to make the money, you need to do what you need to do to live. Yeah. I'm getting message after message after message. Yeah, and you try not to answer them today, I see. Uh. Sometimes I just want to wanna switch my phone off and not attend to anything besides what I want to attend to. And it's just simply not that possible. I would have no cocoa in two, but proof maintaining it for nine. Local lady, who's on Joseph? What's what's my young person? I'm very sad. You get so numb to run to me. I'm I Master, I I'm not going to go to the house. I'm not going to go to the house. I'm not going to go to what do you have to do with my excuses? I So, Portia, graduation. How does it feel to be graduated? You've done a very good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's good. <cool, right? laughs> I'm 
Listen to your mother. Yeah. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to make sure we all dedicate to an amount that we're going to put together. So okay, who's about your transport? Okay, I'll calculate and then I'll text you guys what it'll cost. And then Ukiki will have to go to Bulawayo, to Banano Mama, and then take it from there. To Namu Safuti, and I'm so exhausted. Yeah, I can see. Let's end this here. Uh, thank you guys, it was nice Love talking you guys. to you. See you later, take care. Eh? Thanks, Tom. So those three excerpts give you a feel of um, transactions. Uh, like I said, to those who weren't here earlier, the three excerpts give us an idea of who the family members were, where they were. They were in the UK, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. And um, just the struggles that they faced in terms of the responsibilities of remitting money home. Um, one thing I think people don't know is that the money that comes into the country due to remittances is far higher than development aid that is going into the country. So it's very important in terms of um, keeping the economy afloat and keeping families, um, enabling families to survive. Uh, so I just wanted to give that context and background and then we can get into it. Thank you, um, Professor Dandari. I believe you've seen the film in its entirety. Um, would you mind um, jump-starting the conversation? Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Ruby, for inviting me uh, and making me a part of your conversation. This is really important work. A lot of us spend time looking at the raw numbers. I was just checking out the statistics today where they say that remittances in 2022 are expected to exceed $630 billion. Um, That's a lot of money. And for you to have gone and look at the people behind that money, the faces that we don't see, the people that are working double shifts to make it possible, um, the estimates for Africa are actually quite high. Remittances went up by about 14% across the African continent, even with COVID, even as families abroad are facing inflation and cost of living challenges. So first question for you, what sparked this? What made you think this is the film that I want to make next? So I, I was invited by a South African producer to, to pitch an idea um, to be part of the series Generation Africa. And uh, they wanted to make stories of migration from the perspective of African filmmakers. Cause I think on the global stage and with mainstream media, there's a very singular story of migration and this idea of Africans on boats um, trying to get to Europe, which is one story, but I mean, there are loads of stories when it comes to migration. And one and another kind of um, thing that people probably don't realize is that the majority of migration is happening within Africa, intra-African migration, um, and not people trying to get out of the continent. So I wanted to find somebody who would um, bring that reality of showing us uh, a Zimbabwean who had gone to another African country. And the, the, the kind of idea that kept going on and on in my mind, because at the time I was in the US um, at Hutchins, and I was thinking, what is a big issue for me? And it was the issue of remittances, because I also had to be sending money home. And after speaking to several people who were from different countries, it wasn't just Zimbabweans, you know, I realized that it was just, it's a very global story. It's not um, unique to Zimbabwe. and most communities with the migrant communities understand the story of that responsibility. So um, in trying to make the film, I needed to find a Zimbabwean family. And that was a real challenge. And I think you know that too, Chipo, because you were part of the research. 
just the, the fear that people felt um, when talking about issues to do with money, um, not wanting to discuss their personal financial issues or to, you know, even when we sent out an anonymous survey and we asked if you wanted to chat with us further, people were like, I'm good, or where's this information going? Or is it gonna go back to the government in Zimbabwe? So um, it, it was interesting, the, the process of finding the family, but once um, I connected with Frank in South Africa, everything else just seemed to, to just roll into place. And I was so lucky that um, the Malaba Mube family were willing to, to take this journey with me. And then COVID happened. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question about how do you go about filming um, in three different parts of the world when the world is shut down? Yeah, that was a huge thing. You know, I was really excited. I thought this is exciting. We've got this family that's spread all over the world. And then, you know, I had these ideas of what I would do when I traveled to the different countries. And I went to Cape Town to meet Frank. Um, and this was pre-production before we were starting to shoot. And I, I just did a test shoot and I, and I was thinking, great. And we were starting to plan dates. And it was at that moment, the shutdown was announced um, that we were all going to be uh, well, locked up in our houses for a while. And I literally took the last flight to Zimbabwe on South African Airways um, to spend that time with my family. And we had to put the film into hiatus. At, and at a certain point, because we were delivering to a broadcaster, we just had to get going again. Um, and I was able a few times when uh, the lockdown eased to get back to Cape Town, but the UK was a lot harder. They had a very, very strict lockdown. So I um, connected with a filmmaker from Reunion Island who's based in London. And we had long discussions about what we wanted to see, what we wanted to do to, to bring the, the brother and sister into the story. Um, and I directed it remotely with him, having conversations with the family, conversations with um, Rafiq, who was shooting for me in London, um, and then couriering footage, uploading footage, making sure I had the footage. And then my editor was in Franschhoek in South Africa. So making sure she had the footage, um, so there was a lot of coordination involved. Uh, and I think there are a lot of filmmakers who would not like the idea of editing remotely, but it worked quite well for me because um, I could still be around at home with my kids and still have these long, 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 long conversations with my editor online. Yeah, and I, you know, I think part of it is also losing that ability to be in England where I find personally when I'm doing my own work that when I'm doing field work, just being in the same space with people um, is very helpful. What were those conversations like with the family? So I know Frank is on board, um, but I'm intrigued. What does mama think? What does Gogo think? What do the siblings think about their lives? Zimbabweans are very private and money is complicated anywhere in the world. So what were those conversations like uh, with them to talk about remittances and, and opening up about it? Um, you know, the, my, the first person who came on board was Frank. So initially I thought it was just going to be myself and Frank and we would tell the story together and I'd explain to him what I wanted to try and achieve. And while I was spending time pre-production with Frank, you know, I just noticed he was just constantly on his phone, like constantly. Um, and it was usually with his family. And I thought, this is quite, this is like a big part of your life, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, it's like, there's He's basically all I do all day. Um, so I asked if I could have a conversation with his family to find out what it was like for them having these constant WhatsApp chats and video calls. And he handed over their numbers and said, you know, go for it. Um, and I just, I called them all. I mean, he sent them a message to say I would call, but it was pretty just calling out of the blue and saying, look, my name is Rumbi. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a friend of Frank's. and..." I'm making a film about remittances and also looking at Frank. I don't know where the story is leading, but I really feel that you're a big part of it. Can I have a conversation with you about what you think about remittances? And we were just taking it from there, you know, and they told me about, you know, their shift work and 
all the different challenges they faced and being in the UK, but also the, the, how they felt that the money that they were making in the UK might seem a lot to their family at home, but it's relative to you know, the lifestyle that they lived in the UK. And there were all of these misconceptions back and forth between them and the family at home thinking, well, they're fine, they're out in the diaspora. Um, and then sometimes those outside just thinking everybody at home is just making demands, but uh, you could see there are all these kind of misunderstandings that are created because of the transactions that happen with money. And also because of the tensions of the environment, right? I'm thinking you and I have both lived in the U.S. among students. So Frank's sister jumps out to me as a character that I'm very familiar with, uh, where Zimbabwean students, unlike students, even from most African countries, have this burden, uh, if you want to call it that, this burden of supporting family back home. And the family back home looking at, you know, whether you're earning 500, that's a lot of money for other people, you know, in a different context where things are slightly cheaper in that in that sense. I also want to hear from you um, what the conversations were like with the people back home. So this is uh, one very controversial, right? So we see all these TikToks from Africans talking about families in the diaspora, beeping your phone, and then you send the money and then you don't hear back. But we don't often hear back from the people actually receiving the money, what it means to them, what those transactions look like um, on from their end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's two things. I think there's the reality of what it takes to actually physically get that money, right? Um, once the transaction is done on the phone in some country, um, there's the first issue, which is transaction fees, which are incredibly high when you're sending money to Zimbabwe because of taxes and other issues. Um, so once the money gets hits Zimbabwe, you have to collect the cash. So um, where do you go to collect it? Uh, is there going to be a queue? Will they have the cash on site that day? Will I travel there and find there's no cash and have to go home and then go back again? Um, it's dealing with a lot of those issues. That and that's happening more and more often, right? That people are you get to Western Union, Western Union is shut down, you have to go to World Remedes, like this constant trying to figure out where to actually collect your money. Yeah, so, you know, finding a place where you're sure that there will be cash that day. And it's already a schlep enough um, uh, and like you have to pay for transport to get to a place where you can collect that cash. So it's an expense to go and get it. Um, so there are those frustrations. And then once you do have the cash, how do you spend it? Who is going to benefit from it? So in our film, you'll see that you saw that um, their grandmother was very sick. So there was money that had to be sent towards, towards her health care. Um, the mother, Mam Lilo, was taking care of several of their cousins who were orphans. Um, her late sisters and brother's children, she was taking care of them. Uh, so there's this responsibility to make sure they had an education. And then these young people also wanted to also be part of the pipeline to leave the country eventually. Um, and there are all these little things these that they have to consider. Like one day they don't have electricity, the next day they don't have water, or where am I gonna um, buy this little thing to make sure that the child goes to school the next term? They're, you know, you're always so busy just thinking about issues of survival um, that you're not necessarily thinking about how am I going to uh, invest in infrastructure development. And it's it's not a lot of families who do invest in that kind of infrastructural development. And luckily, then Malaba's family that I documented were investing in infrastructure. The mother was trying to build houses to get rent so that she could have income, so that she could pay for the kids' school fees and pay for food uh, and so on. And, and the pipeline would just continue like this. Yeah, and yet it almost seems like it never ends. Um, I'm, I'm curious about Kiki's um, reluctance, if you will, to leave initially. She's like, yeah, I could go to Portland. But then we see her sort of going through the wheels of, uh, without giving too much of the film, because we want people to go and watch it. But, uh, well, what if I get stuck there and I'm all alone? Did you get to have more conversations with her, spend time, see what other, I, I hear a lot of young Zimbabweans are thinking of leaving 
training to become nurse aides and various positions abroad. What, what was that conversation like with Kiki or others that you might have come in contact with during this work? Well, I, so for those who don't understand, you, there, there are agents that you can go to and they will identify a, a country that you could possibly go to to get um, some form of employment. And in the case of Kiki, um, they had connect, the family had connected with an agent who had uh, recommended that she go to Poland um, and get employment there. But at the time that I was speaking to Kiki, she had a cousin who was already there. And um, she was also just very concerned because she had been hearing quite negative stories about what happens to people once they reached Poland. And her own brother and sister were saying, you know, Poland is not a place you should be going to. Um, how can we maybe get her to come here? Um, uh, so I think Kiki is quite different from her siblings. And that was, that was really intriguing to me as a filmmaker that all of the siblings were quite different in terms of their relationship with uh, responsibility, money and migration. Kiki really did not want to leave. She was so happy in Blow Iowa. She was happy being amongst family. She loves being around people. Um, she, she, she really is like, you know, she loves her Zimbabwe, but she also is struggling. So how do you reconcile that? She has a full-time job and she's struggling to make ends meet. Um, so it's so frustrating for her and the family really think, well, they were saying the solution is that you should go somewhere else where you can make a living. And I think this is the, the human part of the story, right? Is that these transactions are very costly um, to be abroad, even when you're in the best of circumstances and being away from your families, that's costly. In fact, when whenever I think about your documentary, for me, the transactions, it's not just the money, it's the the payment of being away, of being lonely, of mm -hmm. what the young sister is experiencing as a student who has to hustle and then can she compete with other students who don't have the same challenges, right? Um, I think we see for those, I encourage everybody else to watch the film because you see other family dynamics as they're trying to raise their own families, build their own families abroad and still managing the, family back home and so you know I, I felt a lot of sympathy for Kiki which was interesting for me as somebody in the diaspora where normally I'm like well you know you're getting money from abroad what could be the big deal but it is a big deal right the sense of leaving at a particular age I don't know if you saw even a difference between the younger sister and her where it's like you know now she's at a particular age in life and to uproot yourself and also if she left who's going to help mom with um, the other transactions, right? That need to okay in the family, taking care of the grandparents. She's the one who's constantly running around. So you might send the money, but the money requires somebody else to do the actual actioning of mm -hmm. things that, that are happening on the ground. Um, so I don't know if you can speak to those age differences, those uh, even the gender differences between the brothers and the sisters and how they're dealing with the, the remittances. You know, it was really hard for Kiki just to, you know, it was so difficult for her to be on the ground and not be able to contribute like her siblings. Um, and if you watch the film, there is a point where there's a lot of discussion about um, how Kiki is not giving um, or that she's stingy somehow, but she's not stingy, you know, and we find out why in the film as well. So it's, there's this whole idea of the, those who are left behind, um, somehow they've not moved forward with their lives uh, and that they're just sitting around waiting to be given handouts. And that's not the case at all. Um, so I really do, I do feel for Kiki as well because she is the second born um, yet she is still dependent on her siblings and sometimes her mother. Uh, and I've found in conversations with people that a lot of people actually resonate with her because they have been in that situation where they have been at home. They have been the ones who know what's happening. Um, they are the ones who have to let the siblings outside know so-and-so is sick, this has to happen, that's not it there and so on. And they're not appreciated for that. And there's no money, like, remuneration or monetary value put on all of the time and work that they put into making sure that somebody is okay. Um, and as you say, running around, getting the money, 
making sure it goes there. That's paid for, that's built, and somebody's gone to school. Um, and when you're in those countries like ours where things don't function as easily, I mean, just going to collect money can be an all day's work. There's um, uh, some wonderful work by Joyce Chajga, who's a Zimbabwean historian, where she looks at the relationships between the daughter-in-law who lives abroad and sends the money and the daughter-in-law who lives in the country and provides the physical care. And what she finds is that the mother-in-laws tend to love the daughter-in-law who's abroad because she provides the money. But in reality, that money is not as effective without someone on the ground who makes sure that the medicine has been bought, uh, the food has been prepared and procured in you know a decent in a decent way um and you don't have to answer this but did you at all speak to government officials about remittances how the nation benefits um beyond the individual level how the nation is benefiting uh from these remittances or how they forecast right i think last year the government was forecasting um that we would get about four billion dollars from remittances the way uh, a little ahead of themselves, but did you get into any of those conversations? Only informally, not formally. Um, and they're conversations that people have quite a lot. I, I was um, I was reaching out to organizations, and I think what is interesting to to look at is the informal channels of remitting money, right? Because government will talk about the formal channels: what's coming into the banks, what's coming through the, the remitting companies, but far more money is coming through informal channels, you know, put it on a bus, uh, uh, put it something in somebody's account and it pops up in your account somewhere. So those informal channels are actually far higher um, than what's coming in informally, so I understand. Yep. And it would be really interesting to know uh, exactly how much is coming in. So it, Obviously, it makes a huge difference to livelihoods and survival and what happens in terms of our economy. And um, those are conversations that I think it would be interesting if the government had. Yeah, um, and it's also that, you know, with the currency changes, it's made the informal transfers of money even stronger. Um, you know, it's so-and-so needs to pay tuition for their kid who's in Canada. And so they send money to somebody in the UK who then needs money in South Africa and that person needs money in Zimbabwe. It's actually very, um, I was trying to explain the networks to someone whose eyes just, they were blown. Like, so how do you guys, how do people keep track of this? And I thought, well, Zimbabweans are, you know, not just Zimbabwe and Somalis as well. People are very creative, but the money is just moving in this constant flows. Um, of course, the governments lose money because if the systems don't work well, people are going to go through these back channels. Uh, but there's also the attrition, right, with the values changing constantly uh, between countries. I was going to ask too in South Africa if you saw any, well, and this is kind of difficult because of COVID. But what, what I like about Frank is that he's not the upper middle class Zimbabwean that people sometimes think about in, in South Africa. He's somebody who's doing these multiple jobs. How does he how does he manage it all? I think that's something I've heard from people is that, well, Frank is always willing to help even when he hasn't been asked to help. And so how does he manage it all? I was really worried about his mental health at some point watching the film, like he's just gonna explode. He's got his multiple jobs, he's managing everyone's WhatsApp groups and WhatsApp chats and everyone's finances, but how is he managing it all? I don't know, to be honest, like it's it was insane because he, he did struggle uh, a lot. And you say that he's managing the family WhatsApp group and that and what he's also like heavily involved in cultural activities um, with his acting and also the cultural activities in Zimbabwe, staying um, in touch with what's happening on the ground in Zim. So he's very meticulous with his times and very, 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 he's very strict with um, who he shares his time with as well. So he'll go to one job, then he'll go to the next one, then he'll be at an audition, we'll have time for rest. And then he also makes time for his exercise, which is also very important and very good for him. Um, and I think because he's developed a kind of community in Cape Town, he says that that's the place where finally he felt accepted. Um, and because he, he had to live a life of secrecy in Zimbabwe because he is gay, 
when he got to Cape Town, he was able to, you know, openly declare who he was and, and love who he wanted openly, then it became very different for him. Um, and the, the remitting was just part of the day-to-day -day, um, things that he kept in his, his Rolodex. Yeah, and, and South Africa is complicated. We also know that a lot of remittances come through South Africa, whether it's money, um, there was a lot of food provision during COVID. People, again, through these very creative ways, um, using bus systems all the way from Cape Town to Harare. I've heard of people buying things like cheese even from South Africa because it's a lot cheaper to get cheese from, from South Africa all the way to Zimbabwe. But these are the ways that Zimbabweans are transacting every single day for survival. Um, so I am really excited for more people to watch the film, but I think we should pause and let our audience bring in more questions. But if they don't have, I always have more questions. Oh, one quick question I have before the audience floods us with theirs is um, how can we see the entire film? We, and yeah, so we can post that on chat, but if you could answer that. So the film, um, I'm actually going to be in Amsterdam next week for the International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam, IDFA, for um, its European premiere. Uh, once the premiere is, is done, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see it on Arte across Europe. And um, I'm not sure, I'll double check if, if it'll be uh, on Al Jazeera as well um, to be able to, you'll be able to get it there. But we have uh, social media um, pages where we put updates regularly for people mm -hmm. to check where it's gonna be screening next because it is during the festival rounds right now. Uh, and as it's picked up by broadcasters, we usually just put a message up at transactions doc. Thank you. Thank you. That's very um, important information for us. Um, I'll give the audience a little time to gather their thoughts, but I have a, yet another question. Um, and this is kind of stepping back from your film and wondering what kind of conversations you've had with other directors of Generation Africa? What kind of overlaps and themes and issues um, have you experienced? You know, when, once I pitched my idea, everybody was immediately, they said, well, that's the same in my country. That's the same in my country. And, you know, there, there are elements of it, I think, in some of the other films, um, but they're so diverse. The films were we're so, so diverse that it's interesting. I mean, like there's one film about um, uh, the daughter of a South Sudanese politician and coming home and, and reconciling with who her family is. And, and there's stories about um, uh, the trip that migrants take from Nigeria up the west, the coast of West Africa, right up to into to Europe. And um, there's another film about uh, lawyers um, who were involved in a moot court competition in Southern Africa who are arguing about international humanitarian law about issues of migration. So, I mean, there's diverse stories, but everybody said that they could relate to the idea of remittances. Yes. Your film is so well done that we all can relate, even as non-directors and non-filmmakers, very human experiences that you um, convey to us. Um, let's see, Belinda Dodson has a question. Would you like to present uh, your question? Yes, am I unmuted? It says the host is not allowing participants to unmute. You are unmuted. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Rumbi, first, just what a wonderful clip, and I'm looking forward to watching the whole movie. Um, I've done some work on remittances in Southern Africa, like academic work with something called the Southern African Migration Project. And Zimbabwe was one of the countries that we looked at. Um, and I guess I've also had conversations with Zimbabwean migrants, mostly in, in South Africa. Um, but I guess two, two questions that intrigue me. One is the whole thing of in-kind rather than monetary remittances. So I was intrigued that, for example, the medication, you know, it comes from Frank. Uh, I mean, Chipo, I think, mentioned cheese. 
Um, but to what extent, you know, do those kind of, you know, food, whatever, clothing, electronic gadgets, medications, to what extent did those come up in the movie? And then I'm also interested in the in the gender or I suppose sex differences. Um, so just male, female, I realize that's oversimplistic. But our kind of Southern African migration program research showed that women are more reliable remitters, but they're often working in lower paid jobs so they can send less. So, you know, they look like less good remitters because the amount of money they can send is lower, but actually they're sending a higher proportion of what they earn. So I wondered if you encountered any of those kind of differences too. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Um, in terms of uh, uh, material remittances, uh, the film is, is 52 minutes long, so it's mostly looking at um, monetary remittances, but there was the case, obviously, of Frank sending medication home. And it's just, you know, Bait Bridge is the busiest border in the whole of Africa, and it's the border between South Africa and Zimbabwe. Every day, material remittances are being sent across the border just groceries is just the most basic um, uh, example of that. I don't have the statistics, but it's 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 massive. It really is. And then um, in terms of the the male and female, yeah, I don't know if you've got those statistics because Chipo and I did some research, and she can speak more to that. Um, but definitely, I, I I do believe what you're saying is correct. I think one in four families in South Africa send remittances in kind plus money. And then in our research, we found that the largest uh, donations or remittances were from men, but women were remitting at least almost one, one is to two to, to men. Uh, so women send more frequently as well than men do. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Christabel Zulu. She asks, what was your central theme when you decided to make this film? I'm realizing there are a lot of themes building upon each other. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Christabel. The, the central theme was migration and then it just spread off from there. I decided I wanted it to really focus on remittances, but then the family was bringing out so many of the themes that also mirrored the research that we had initially done into remittances, um, themes of, of, of mental health issues, um, the healthcare system, um, financial literacy, uh, um, and a lot of these um, different themes kind of manifest themselves in, in, in the film just organically. I didn't try to do it, but just, they are really a representation of a Zimbabwean family. Um, and our research also showed that most of the um, money that's being sent home is being used for emergency health care, for groceries and food. Um, and Chippa, what were the other ones? Tuition was big um, as health care and yeah, like basic everyday needs, things that ideally salaries should be providing for, then remittances were stepping in. And then once in a while you would get cases, interesting data, people in the Middle East we're sending more money that's going towards these big development projects, but it'd be interesting to follow up with them to see how those projects have fared. Right. Thank you. Uh, Marsha Mutisi, would you like to speak? Marsha Mutisi? Yes, I've been able to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just really happy to be here. Rumbi and I went to high school together. So my question is really more on, given you know her experience and really, I believe you're spending more time now in Zimbabwe than anywhere else. Cause I feel like if I just drop everything and move to Zimbabwe tomorrow, just to stop, you know, the expectations and the pressures I have from family, will this solve my problem? So I just wanted to hear your experience as somebody who's lived in the, educated in the diaspora, spent time and now mostly in Zimbabwe. What, what you know, from an individual standpoint, is, is, are the pressures less if you're living in Africa <laughs> from all these demands of, you know, 
if I just relocate, will I be okay? If I go to live in the village in Zimbabwe, will nobody stop asking me for money? <laughs> hey, Marsha, it's good to see you. Um, you know, the, the expectations are just the same if you're on the ground and if you're perceived to have a bit more um, financially than, than your family, other family members. Uh, and now because the situation is just so, it's difficult for everybody. Um, I think globally we're going into a, a very tough time. Um, everybody's asking everybody for money all the time. Uh, so what I've found, especially with them, my friends and family who come to visit, the exhaustion that I see on their face by the time they leave because they're like, Zimbabwe is so expensive. Um, and because you're coming in for such a short time, the demands are all at once. And, it, and if you live here, it's, I suppose it's, it's spread out more. So probably less pressurized and, you know, get used to it. But do you think that the diaspora itself has created these expectations that uh, people must send money? What would happen if people didn't respond to every ask? Uh, and I'm, I'm asking a question that was asked about Frank, like what would happen if he didn't respond to every single ask that was made of him? You know, it's interesting because Miles, their brother Miles said like, it's an honor to send money home. And it's, you know, it's something that everybody's done. And it's true, historically, we've always migrated. Um, if you think back to the men who migrated to the mines and would send money home, um, people who migrated right around Africa, uh, it's not a new thing to remit money home. Um, and there is that expectation, I do believe, that you must help the extended family because we are all one big family and we all take care of one another, but we live in a different financial system in the world now and it's how we, we, we use that money and spend it is quite different. Um, so I think, yes, we do, the, in the diaspora, that expectation is placed on us. And if the money were not sent, um, I think that's another conversation we would be having. It would be a very, very serious political conversation about what would happen on the ground if people did not have the money that they would expect to get from the diaspora. If no money was coming in, considering that this money from the diaspora is an important part of our economy, what would happen on the ground? Rumbi, um, in my experience, I have found that there are a couple of vehicles for remittances and they seem to hold a monopoly on the whole system and they're prohibitively, the prohibitive, prohibitively costly. Um, you've kind of touched upon this, but what are the other ways in which money can be transferred or back channels or other on the ground? ground level channels. Mm. So there, there are obviously the, um, the remittance companies, um, money transfer companies uh, that people usually know, the bigger ones. And then there are smaller ones too, um, by smaller companies, some Zimbabwean. Um, and I think Mukuru is probably one of the busiest companies on the ground, but there are a lot of smaller ones that are coming up, um, Access Forex, um, uh, Send It To, uh, there are a lot of smaller ones on the ground too, and Econet, which is a um, big mobile telecommunications company that is now doing a whole lot of other things, is also into remittances now. But what I obviously find really interesting is the informal channels and how people are sending money, say, on buses or on like, you know, pub public transport um, that is networking around the continent. And it's actually very reliable. Um, and you can get your money to your family member, wherever you send them, you call them and you say, the money is with this bus driver on this bus. They will go and find that bus driver. And if you miss that bus driver that day and they go back to South Africa, next time they're back, they will have your money. So um, it's a cheaper way because uh, transfer fees are so high, so incredibly high, it's, it's prohibitive. Um, so people need to find other ways of sending the little bit of money that they want to send home. Thank you. There's a question um, from the audience. 
are we enabling the governments and in fact hindering the political change with these transactions? Uh, you, you know, we're sending money to our families. So uh, it's not something where you can say, well, I'm not gonna send money to my mother anymore. It's just, you're not gonna do that. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it's, it's, it helps to have that money coming in because the responsibility that should be with the government is now being taken over by somebody else. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a complicated one that I can't really answer here, I don't think. Definitely. Um, there is a audience member, Enu Watioka. Would you like to speak? Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rumbi, for uh, capturing the lives of Zimbabweans and other nations in the diaspora so intricately and so accurately. Um, I look forward to watching the entire film uh, when we can. So I wanted to ask if you managed to capture also, I understand that there are people who buy stuff online and then it gets delivered to their relatives or friends um, in country. Um, did you get to also, um, I, I mean, consider that in your estimations of, or you were just capturing the monetary value and not translating the money that is used to purchase those things and also trying to establish what could be the equivalent in terms of cash? Um, so I just basically followed one family and how they do their remittances. And all um, right, all right. They, they were sending money and then their mother, the matriarch of the family was the mm -hmm. one who decided how the money was shared and spent. Mm -hmm. So once the money came to her, she, you knew that a certain amount will go to school fees, uh, mm -hmm. a certain amount will go to her building projects, and a certain amount would go to Google's health care. Um, so that was one way of doing it. But I know with our research, you know, it's what you're saying it was came up a lot too, how people like buy online and, and the money, the, the, the goods, the groceries or whatever gets to the family at home. But that's not something that came up in this particular film. Okay, my, my, last, uh, my last question is, I might have missed this at the very beginning. I want to hear it from you. What was your, your goal of capturing this? So, um, yeah, I did mention it at the beginning. So it was about migration. So I was part of a, a series of films, 25 films from 16 African countries, uh, looking to change the narrative around migration. So African filmmakers, making stories about migration from their perspective and they were diverse stories. So when I was asked by the producer, um, what aspect of migration do you wanna look at? I said, I wanna look at remittances. And then everything happened from there. I found the characters and we were able to shoot the film with them. Thank you. Um, Professor Dendari, would you like to offer a last comment before we close? Um, yeah, thank you, Rumbi. Everyone, please watch so that we can have more conversations about the film. And good luck on the film circuit. I hope you get more awards because this is incredible. And I think it resonates not just with Zimbabweans, but with the one in three people around the world who live away from their home countries and send remittances back home. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for this wonderful conversation and thank you Rumbi for this great film we must all watch it for sure and I also just say thank you to all of you Krishna Tom everybody at Hutchins it's like a homecoming for me being able to to talk to you today so thank you for having me and thank you Chipo for the conversation we look forward to seeing you both in person <laughs> <laughs>